here with American Songwriter. We had the opportunity to talk to Frank Meyer and Bruce Duff of Streetwalk and Cheetahs, along with the return of Josie Cotton. Adam was able to talk to the three of them on the phone. It was awesome having Josie back. If you haven't already checked out her interview, it's on our website and everywhere you listen to podcasts. She is known for Johnny Are You Queer and many other awesome 80s hits. So Flatten the Curve, it's not a band, but it's a song about the coronavirus pandemic. And it was written by Frank Meyer of the Street Walkin' Cheetahs. And it was produced by his bandmate, Bruce Duff. And the song features 31 musicians from Josie Cotton to members of Screeching Weasel, The Runaways, The Adolescents, and many more. There's a really cool video of it on YouTube. And after you check out uh, that amazing video on YouTube, check out our YouTube channel at Bringing It Backwards. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter at Bringing Back Pod. We'd appreciate your support if you follow and subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. We're Bringing It Backwards with Frank Meyer and Bruce Duff of Streetwalk and Cheetahs and Josie Cotton. Hello, hello. What's going on? This is Frank. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, Frank. How are you? I don't know what I'm doing. Hi, Josie. Hi, Josie. Oh, hi. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi, Josie. Hi. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm quite well. I'm a little confused. It's the first time I'm doing this on the on my computer, so it's a little tricky. Oh, the Zoom. Yeah. You you sounds good. Oh, good. Well, you sound fabulous. Thank you. We try. <laughs> Josie, you're our first repeat customer. Oh, I am? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for doing this again. Oh, yeah. No, it's great. Oh, there. I sense there's an emoji representing a phone that's probably Bruce. <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm on the landline because of the uh, signal up here. It's definitely the my voice won't freeze. I, I did a Zoom call last night and I sounded like, uh, you know, the Terminator or something. It wasn't uh, good. Yeah, it gets all robotic when it slows yeah. down a little bit. <laughs> I like it. I think it's cool. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's a good effect, but well, I'm not going for that today. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bruce, for for joining us. Thanks, Frank and Josie. Uh, I'm excited uh, to do this. Yeah. Yeah, this is a big one for us. Big time. (laughs) Yeah, so our podcast is about your guys' journey in the music industry. I already had, we got Josie's story earlier uh, a few weeks back, but um, we'd love to hear how you guys got into music and then, of course, the Flatten the Curve song and, and the whole project. Frank, take it away. Yeah, where were you born and raised, Frank? Uh, I was born in um, San Mateo County, so up north. Oh, Bay Area? Yeah, but um, my folks ended up in L.A., and I grew up in L.A., and I kind of grew up, you know, at a time when I was a kid, you know, it was like the early 80s, and there was just a big music scene in Los Angeles, and, you know, as soon as I heard... Uh, just the right amounts of hard rock and punk rock. I knew I wanted to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And kind of early on, um, I went to school with the Zappa kids and I knew uh, Dweezil and he was sort of instrumental in teaching me guitar early on. And there was just a lot of musicians hanging around in the Zappa household. And so I think kind of early on, I just kind of had this sense that like it was a very doable job you Mm -hmm. know i mean again this was a different time different era and i was young and full of stars in my eyes but uh, (laughs) i think that i saw a lot of these people who seemed like these big rock stars were just like oh but they're people over at this guy's house and they're like real people and some of them are nice and some of them not so nice but it made the idea of getting into show business i think a lot more sort of achievable whereas maybe Mm -hmm. a kid in Iowa or something might not have that access and might be like, well, how would I, right? How would I do that? Right. Whereas I would kind of like, well, I could ask that guy. He's in a huge band. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Well, what was the first uh, instrument you learned to play? I gravitated to guitar really young. Uh, I yeah. loved music. And when I heard, I think it was Joan Jett was kind of the, artist that made me super passionate about music as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of just wanted to be Joan Jett, you know. Um, but <laughs> I didn't really have any goal or 
plan. I wasn't really writing songs. I think I just wanted to be cool like Joan Jett. And I love the sound of that music. When I heard Van Halen on the radio a few years later and really just Eddie's guitar, that's mm -hmm. when I was just like, what is that sound? That's what I want to <laughs> do. And that's when I started playing guitar and getting a bit more passionate. And then around that time is when I met uh, Dweezil and he was just a little bit older than me, but like a total virtuoso and knew everyone and was cool and had a four track and wanted to like write songs and jam and ride bikes. And, you know, like he was just a, a cool kid, but he was very inspirational for me as a youngster. And mm -hmm. again, because of the eras, a couple years later, I'm in junior high school and I'm, you know, reading LA Weekly and BAM and there's all these bands that seemed really happening and turned out to be really big bands. Jane's Addiction, Fishbone, Guns mm -hmm. N' Roses. And those were the first bands I saw live. And of course, if your first concerts are like early unsigned Guns N' Roses and <laughs> yeah. Poison and Jane's Addiction and Fishbone and Chili Peppers, all like just at the height of their awesomeness, like... Of course, Jeez. I became a musician. You know, why? <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's that's incredible. I mean, yeah, just growing up there in LA and and being able to have access to, and to it was that a great life. time in music. And you know, Josie was a you know big part of the new wave scene happening there. And I was always you know like I loved punk rock and I loved new wave and I mm -hmm. loved kind of hard rock and heavy metal and all of that stuff when I was just getting exposed to music was really happening in Los Angeles. There's like a big new wave scene, a big punk rock scene and a big hair metal scene. And I would just thought all of it was awesome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and from there, did you start a band or did you start playing? Yeah, when I, well, stuff? yeah, I was a kid. And, and like I said, everyone, I mean, to me, it didn't seem like that much of a stretch because like my buddy was already playing music and, uh, so yeah, was my first band I started and I played the Troubadour when I was 14. Um, an early version of that band had Josh Freeze on drums. And oh my God! Wow. was playing guitar. My very first band had River Phoenix on guitar. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh my God. Um, so my early bands, I had Donovan Leach uh, in in one band and River Phoenix, and then Dweezil, and um, this guy Chris Peters, who's Mom was Leslie Ann Warren, and his dad was John Peters, the guy that they wrote Shampoo about. And oh. so, you know, because it was like the early <laughs> 80s, it was the Valley, and everyone's parents was like in show business when I was a kid. And, you know, the, and so that's sort of just who we hung out with. And um, so, again, all these thoughts of like, well, I'm going to go play a gig and be famous. Like, I was like, oh, it could happen. And my brother was an <laughs> actor, and, you know, my brother got, was an actor, and he got famous really early on. So all of a sudden there was that, which is just to say, again, I was like, well, hell, that guy right there who lives, he lives with me, he, he can do it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very cool. When did you meet Josie? And were you, did you meet her? Uh, I met Bruce. Those? I only met Josie fairly recently through Bruce. Bruce and okay. I met in the '90s I, when my band, The Streetwalking Cheetahs, was well. So essentially, what happened to answer your first question is I, I started a bunch of like teenage bands, and then in college, I played in bands always kind of around LA, playing around everything from grunge bands, <laughs> blues bands, hard rock bands, punk rock bands. Eventually, formed The Streetwalking Cheetahs in '95. We were on Bomp Records for a few records, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we, we we almost got like sent over to Bruce as like punishment, uh, <laughs> which is a funny way that we met each other in that I was dealing with uh, one of the guys from Bomp and he and I used to always butt heads and I we got into an argument and I said, you know, I don't even know we should be on this label. And he's like, I don't think you should be on this label any longer. And I was like, well, actually, we technically you're supposed to do a new, another record with you guys. What are we supposed to do about that? And he goes... <laughs> I think maybe you should talk to another like, why don't you go talk to Bruce Duff? And I wasn't sure like what he meant by that, but I hung up the phone. I was like, actually, that's not a terrible idea. Uh, Bruce is known as, you know, being a good dude. He's a musician. He plays in the ads and played in a few bands I dug. And I thought that he meant it friendly, but I wasn't totally sure. He might have just been like, maybe Bruce Duff and his crazy ass can handle you, young man. But uh, <laughs> we went over to Triple X Records. Bruce signed us, and then Bruce and I became friends and formed a band called Sweet Justice and a band called Angus Khan. And then eventually, when the Cheetahs reunited, Bruce was the clear, <clears throat> logical choice to be the guitar player. 
And all that led us to flatten the curve. And Bruce at that point had a relationship with Josie and was, they were making records together. So he brought her into the mix. Very cool. Wow. wow. Yeah, man. <laughs> so Bruce, how did you get into music? Where did you, where were you born and raised? Uh, I grew up in Riverside, uh, not to be confused with genocide or homicide, but uh, I was like, I was already playing in bands by the time I was 13. We we're playing like school dances and stuff like that and uh, car shows or whatever the heck you could get a gig on. And so I was playing a lot all the way through school. And then um, uh, after college, I was playing in, still out in the Inland Empire, I was playing in a band called Numbers, which was essentially the Inland Empire's answer to the tubes. We had a big show, we had projections and TV sets and smoke machines and, you know, all kinds of lighting stuff and three front people, two guys and a girl, and they played characters and changed costumes, and it was a whole show. And we started wow. playing Hollywood a lot. And every label came out to see us, and they were all convinced, A, we didn't have a hit song, and B, uh, we've already seen how much money the tubes know how to lose. We don't need, need another one of these. So that sort of fizzled out, and by then I moved to Hollywood and uh, was hustling around trying to get in a band. Uh, at, at the same time, I was writing for magazines a lot. I became an editor at Music Connection, and... You know, it was in that scene. And through that, I, I saw the band 45 Grave, who I just fell in love with. It was almost like I felt someone had handed me an application to fill out, what do you want to see in a band? And like, check, check, check. Everything I was looking for was in this one band. Mm -hmm. Their bass player uh, left for a half a year. And during that half year, I finagled my way into the group. And that kind of, uh, it kind of launched me locally like their uh main roadie guy was a fellow named Jeff Dahl who had a band. I ended up playing with him. Uh, le uh, during my half year in the band, we got a keyboard player named Paul Rossler. And then later uh, he had a band called Twisted Roots and I played with him. And Paul Rossler fits into the story hugely as he now uh, runs Kitten Robot Records, which is Josie's label. And I, I actually met Josie through working uh, on a record for Triple X. When I was there, I was uh, mixing a couple records with Geza X, and uh, Geza and Josie owned a studio in Hollywood uh, up above the Comedy Store, and I loved working there, and uh, that's how I got to meet them. We actually got Josie on an ads record doing sort of a Valley Girl Speak part, which oh, she really? did in one Hey, I, it's amazing. She did it in one take, and I was just like, where did that come from? I was. We didn't tell her what to say or anything. We just, well, here's the idea. It's good. I got it. And just, wow, all right. So that was the beginning of that. Wow. <laughs> okay. And then you guys all got together for this, for this new project, or song at least. Yeah, I mean, it sort of started like it, – it, 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 it's, it was an idea that kind of just grew and grew and grew. Uh, I basically got frustrated that we couldn't even practice anymore, much less do shows or tour. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that affected all my, my business work with the bands I managed. So I'm like, well, what can I do? And I got a nice little home studio here where I mix records and stuff. I go, well, I can get everybody, I you know, to work remotely. And I know a lot of people that have – a setup similar to this. So if we get everybody involved, we can get tracks from everybody, but, but what are we going to do? So I said to Frank, I go, kind of told me the idea. I go, let's get as many people as we can on something, but what is it? Do you got anything? And two days later, he had written the song, Flatten the Curve. <laughs> well, tell me. And it worked perfect. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I like the idea of, of, uh, you know, getting all these artists together and doing this song. And um, I think at one point Bruce mentioned We Are the World, but I think he meant more in terms of the idea of a bunch of people on one song. Mm -hmm. I don't think he necessarily meant like to do a whole like charity song. But when he said that, in my head, I was like, oh, you know, right now they're telling us all we got to stay inside and I had just started seeing that that term flatten the curve kind of start to pop up a little bit. It wasn't really in the public consciousness yet. 
but it also seemed like a totally cool rock and roll title. And mm-hmm. so in my head, I just thought, well, if we're going to get all these people and if we're going to do it, there should be some sort of message. And then maybe that message should just be reinforcing everyone to just like stay home and chill out and don't panic. And, you know, and then it's not really political and something we can all kind of wrap our heads around. But this was super early in COVID and quarantine and all that stuff. So we didn't mm-hmm. really, as Bruce has said before, like we didn't really realize it was going to have such staying power. We were like, oh, put this out in the next few weeks and then in a month or so, when well, we're all out of here, it'll be a laugh. <laughs> right. you know, we actually felt really pressure really to work out. quickly <laughs> because we thought, well, this will be over in a month. You know, right. everybody was talking about by July, everything will be back to normal. And then as we've seen, that didn't come to pass. Sure. Norm- yeah. normally, normally you want your songs to have staying power Power. In this case, I feel like it's a mixed, a mixed. Blessing. Yeah, this wasn't what we were hoping for. Believe sure. me. Sure. Yeah, when I talked to Josie, we we chatted like what about a month ago, I think, Josie, and you were telling yeah, yeah. me a little bit about this because I was I was we were talking about uh, Johnny Are You Queer, and then how I said the first time I had heard the song was the Screeching Weasel version of it, and we were talking about how, and then you said, oh, I got you know got Ben Weasel on the song. And so tell me about getting all these people together. Like, how did you narrow down the people and and get the project well, really going? Step one was reaching out to everybody and go, hey, can you even do this? Like, are you set up to to do it? Because at that time, people literally were not, really weren't leaving their houses around here. So, I mean, if you didn't have it at your home or a way to do it, then you, you kind of, and there were, there were a number of people we reached out to go, Great idea, but no, I, I don't I don't have that kind of equipment. So, so that was step one, and seeing who could do it. So we we sort of cast the net pretty wide with people we either worked with, played with, knew personally, or had done shows with, or worked with on labels, or I was their publicist, or who knows, just kind of things like that. Both me and Frank, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I, I think more people said, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Just, let's get it going. So, I, you know, when it ended up being 31 people, I don't think we thought <laughs> it would come together at that level, but it did. So we just figured out how to make it work. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at, like, um, a list of all the players on here, and, like, you'll it'll say, like, guitars, and there's, like, about eight people or five keys players. Like, you said, like, how did that arrangement happen? Did you just send them one version of the song and let everybody kind of add their piece to it? Well, there was, there was a master. It, it, okay. It went like this. There was a master version of the demo that Frank made, which was pretty elaborate. It had like doubled vocals, harmony vocals, uh, at least four guitars, a couple of keyboards, bass, drum machine. It was a very complete arrangement. So I go, mm-hmm. let's use this, but Let's put a human drummer on it as step one, and everyone can overdub to the drummer. So we got this fellow, Steve Kravec, who's a record producer up in, I think he's around Castaic. And he has his own studio and a drum set there and everything. So he did a, a pretty pro version, and kind of he threw in that break beat at the end and stuff. That wasn't in the original thing. Mm-hmm. And so we sent everybody versions of that, and then Frank sent me stems of the different parts. And so if you're going to play guitar on it, here's the demo, here's the whole thing, here's the demo without guitars. So whatever it was you were going to do, we would just send them the whole completed version. So if you're a singer, you hear the lyrics and see how it goes. And then a version without it so you can do it your way over it. Got so that's it. how we did it. Yeah. And then you were and able just, to grab, like, I'm looking here. So, for example, um, on the keys, like you have Chris Freeman and, um, you know, Aaron Mitten. And how did like so? What you had one keys part, but did you let them kind of like write their own piece, and they just know what key? Yeah, yeah. Then? Everybody kind of came question. up, particularly on the keyboards and the guitars. Well, actually, all the instruments. Everybody sort of came up with their own lines or their own parts or whatever. So, the, it, it, what ended up happening is the first thing that I had complete were the three bass players. So. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, you can't have three basses. That's going to sound terrible. So I got to come up with one 
cohesive bass line that these guys play. So one guy goes into the other guy. And I worked that out and listened to it. And I go, well, geez, that sounds really great. So that kind of mm-hmm. became my template of finding parts that could either coexist or right under the whole song. And then, so like well, Billy from Jet Boy, he sent over six tracks. And I was like, well, man, I don't know if I need all this stuff. But they were all just like little licks that dropped in answering a vocal or something like that. And they were repetitive. So they became like little figures that I could use throughout the song. And Dennis Tech did a similar thing. And so a lot of guys kind of did that where they figure, oh, here's a little riff. Uh, that we can add in, and that becomes something that's like its own little hook when it rolls by. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I just sort of featured those things. Some people played rhythm guitar all the way through. Uh, Paul Rosser played a piano all the way through and an organ and just pull out little p- pieces that I need as I need them. So a lot of it was assembling the thing, lining it up so it was in time, and then deleting parts, you know, muting parts so mm-hmm. uh, that they weren't always happening. I mean, when I played the whole thing at once, you know, it sounded like a garbage disposal going off. It was just this <laughs> yeah. roar, you know. And then once you toned it down and kind of focused on things, it sounded really good. Wow. Yeah, that must have been pretty epic to mix that many. I mean, I mean, guitar parts from different people. But I guess if you were tracking something, there's still a lot of moving pieces to every song. But But having everybody kind of playing the same thing and, and putting... Pacing it together, yeah, that sounds like it would be quite the process. Yeah, and and with the singers, not everybody really had a great setup. So some of the vocals were like, oh, dear, how do I make that sound good? But pull it <laughs> off, you know. And some people had really great setups. And a couple people had, uh, like Eddie Spaghetti goes, geez, I really don't know how to do this. But my son does. He's here. So, you know, his son engineered it for him. So oh, that's cool, yeah. That, that was handy. There, there was a couple of cases. I think Cherie Curry's uh, son helped her out, too. He's pretty good with the Pro Tools and stuff. Nice. Yeah, was, and did you all three, like, kind of throw your suggestions in as far as personnel to play on the song? Uh, no, it was pretty much just me and Frank. I don't think anyone else brought anything in. Uh, ben Weasel I had just talked to because of Josie because they had done a duet together. So I hit him up. He was the one that was like, well, I I don't really know what I'm doing, and I won't do it if it's political. And I'm like, well, it's not political. It's just about being having some common sense. So uh, so he was on board, but he had a real hard if – you, if you've seen the video, that's him at the beginning of the end of it trying to get his equipment to work, which we thought was sort of a funny framework for the whole thing. Yeah, and then the, – so everybody just kind of sent you a video of themselves – playing that was song. step two that, you know frank could tell you more about that basically he he had some time because let's do a video and that happened at a time when we were already thinking okay this is kind of over we're definitely you know things are opening up now just, but what the hell let's make a video and then of course we went in reverse but uh, yeah frank uh rounded up everybody to do the video and a whole other technical transformation <laughs> well i mean it was yeah, it's similar that, frank. Sim- it was a similar project in that we had everyone send me clips of them lip syncing their part or playing their part or, you know, whatever their element of the song was. Um, and I, for one thing, uh, essentially volunteered one day talking to Bruce to do it and kind of just assumed that like half the people would flake and it would just be something way more manageable and then I wouldn't actually get like 32 clips. And of course I got 32 clips and was <laughs> completely overwhelmed. and was like, why did I agree to do this? What was I thinking? But it came out great and it was super fun to do. But I had sent everyone sort of a spec sheet, you know, mm-hmm. like shoot it like this, make it in this. And of course, maybe half the people paid attention to that and the rest just gave me what they gave me. So <laughs> it was like Bruce said, I was dealing with like different phone, you know, every phone has different codecs when it does its video. Oh yeah. And X, some are MP4s and some are MOVs. And you know what I mean? There's just like, you're getting all these different formats and I'm dumping them all into Adobe Premiere and some of them it's not liking more than others and I'm having to do transfers. And then again, I asked everyone, just record yourself from the top of the song 
even if you only sing one line, I don't care what you're doing during your, you know, the parts that you're not singing or whatever, but like lining it all up, it'll be easier for me if everyone starts. With, no one did that. I did so, that. So, oh. <laughs> no, you did it. You did it. But I'm saying oh, out of 32 out. people, maybe, maybe like four or five, Josie included, did it. And like, and I just said, like, if, if it's not your part, just dance around, have a good time, or just ignore it and just assume I'm not going to use footage of you sitting there looking bored and annoyed. And a couple people like Josie and a few did that. Most people just like started rolling 10 seconds before their section and then <laughs> sure. stopped and sent me that. <laughs> so it was, again, it's all good because everyone's in the video doing their thing. But mm -hmm. the people I leaned on were the ones like Josie, who actually gave me more content to work with and were just kind of having a good time and bopping around. It just gave me more stuff to cut away. But anyway, so we did it. And it all, it all came out great. And again, the, the thing was to make it all cohesive because some people were inside, some people were on webcams and in like dark rooms, some people were outside shooting on like a nice Canon 5D and it looked mm -hmm. beautiful. Um, so trying to make something that didn't just like make your eyeballs bleed when you watched it with all these visuals like light, dark, light, dark, grainy, yeah. perfect. Yeah, 4K, <laughs> 3K, 2K, ah! You know, uh, I had to kind of rein it all in, but mm -hmm. it, it came out really good. And the funny thing about the Ben Weasel thing is that um, for the most part, there wasn't a lot of outtakes in that like people weren't like talking to the camera when it wasn't rolling or doing anything like that. And of course, I want to make all the artists look good. So it's not like if someone wasn't paying attention or they were picking their nose that I would put that in the video. And of sure. course, I assume people had that confidence. However, Ben's video, he st it had like two minutes of him talking at the beginning and kind of yelling at his computer. <laughs> and, and then at the end, and like I had so much comedy material to work with. And the fact that, and I wasn't sure whether he meant to send me that or not. And I kind of just never brought it up. And I never asked Bruce because I was afraid that he might go, oh, that's on there? No, 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 no. take all that. Up. Because it was so funny. And so I just anchored the whole video around Ben like struggling to work his computer. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> what was your favorite part of this process, Josie? Well, I mean, I'm I'm the person who just came in as a singer without all the organizational uh skills of, of these two gentlemen. Mm -hmm. But um I mean I, I have to say uh it was a little daunting to uh to sing something with no direction at all and uh, I, I, you know pretty much asking myself how I liked what I did and uh, <laughs> and then me responding back. Uh, <laughs> you like that, Josie, about yourself? No, no, Josie, I don't. And so it was it was a it was a kind of like therapy uh doing this. So uh that, that the <laughs> musical part, you know, um I, I got through that okay. I, I was actually terrified when the part about the video came through because I really don't know how to film myself, and I had to, I had to create a a stand out of like a broomstick and a mic stand and, and electrical tape, and <laughs> falling down and uh, and uh, and then it was. I, I mean, I did it so many times, and and I couldn't see, and there was no mirror. I couldn't see myself, and I just felt like I was uh, I was doing mime like for, a, a, you know, like a. a auditorium full of people and having never done mime before it was just felt so, <laughs> you know just so uh, uh you know unconnected to any any kind of you know aesthetic from a, a producer or uh, even myself because i'm now like the film director and the and the artist and the uh, and the dancer and the, <laughs> everything so it was tricky uh but i mean the fun part i think the most fun part for me it all had to do with whether the song was too corny or not. Before I heard the song, I didn't know. I loved the idea. And when Bruce said, like, we are the world, I went, oh, oh, no. Please don't make it like we are the world. So um, and luckily, it wasn't. It was just this really fun song. And um, uh, it was it was so rock and roll. And it, by the time I, I heard it, most people were on there. And I think I was the last person to to finally throw my video into the into the pie, and um, and everything, but I just I guess still can't believe how they 
took all of those artists and made it so cohesive. It's it's really pretty phenomenal and fast. Mm -hmm. It was done so quickly. That was the most amazing thing. Yeah. How how was the feeling when you got to hear the song fully finished? Like from getting the demo and singing your part to having the whole thing done and being able to hear it that way. Well, I mean, for me, I, I, I love the whole experience. I'm, I'm so uh, hard on myself. I would have loved to have been able to do more, you know, different takes of it and, and uh, take it, you know, to, uh, you know, a better version of myself, but I, 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 I was able to, uh, you know, let that go at some point and just re enjoy the whole experience of everybody all together. It was cool to have you just people, it, you just didn't, the randomness of it was, was very fun for me. I love that. Mm -hmm. I was blown away. I think Bruce did a great job. He, he makes it all himself. I wasn't involved in any of that stuff. Uh, and he wor worked on it. So he kind of had a sense as to what it was building up into, but I had no sense. So to mm -hmm. me, it was super cool, especially to hear people like Josie and Lisa. Like when I wrote it, it was just me multi-tracking myself and with my own male voice. And I have a, you know, I can sing lots of different parts, but to hear uh, a bunch of really awesome singers and then to hear a bunch of female singers on it and everyone's doing harmonies, like it all was just so beyond where my brain was thinking originally with the song. So it was, it was a really, really cool. And what a cool way to like get everybody together too. I mean, you have all these musicians that are all in the same situation, you know, coming together to, to put out the song. And then it's it's going to support a charity, right? Some of the yeah funds. You want to tell me about that? Uh, basically, it's two charities. So we set set it up through distribution, so that when money comes in for uh, the record itself, that goes to a. Uh, uh, a foundation called Jubilee Jump, uh, which my wife works with, and let's w wish her a happy birthday today, which it is. Happy I just birthday, came from a little birthday. mini porch birthday party. Um, <clears throat> anyways, her foundation, uh, they collect, uh, they fund uh, this, ju uh, this jump rope class, which uh, benefits uh, inner city kids here in L.A. Uh, and it's kind of taken off in a little different direction now because jumping rope is something you can do by yourself and it requires physical distance. So, it, you know, it's the perfect thing for right now. And they have like a mentor program and they teach kids about nutrition and stuff like that. And just, you know, try to get people that want it. It's sort of like kids that want to be involved in sports, but they weren't really those kind of kids that tend to get involved and, mm -hmm. and now they are. And so it, it kind of gets them involved in the community a little bit more, gets them a little more social, gets them a little more active and learning about, uh, you know, how to eat right and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, and then the cool. songwriting portion of it, uh, goes to our friends over at uh, Sweet Relief, which is, uh, as I'm sure you know, a, a charity that helps musicians uh, mm -hmm. down on their luck when uh, health insurance runs out or any number of things that could be happening right now, uh, such as lost revenue and what have you. The, you can go to Sweet Relief and uh, hopefully get some uh, get some relief. Sure. Yeah. Idea, anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, very cool. Um, I love the song. I love the concept, and it, it's really cool to to see how it all kind of came together with with all you guys. And I appreciate you talking to me today. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I have one more question. I want to see. I've gotten an answer from Josie before, but maybe I can get another one. <laughs> I want to know if if you have advice for aspiring artists. Are you asking me? All three of uh, you. I know I've you've answered the question before. Yeah, but I, have, I, I have asked it, answered it, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, I, I would just say, since I manage bands and see kind of what stuff comes up, I would say two things. One, and it's something I learned how to do real early on, and I just forced myself to do it, uh, is learn how to read a contract. I remember when I, when I was in 45 Grave, we got a pretty big contract from Enigma, which was a new label, Fortunately, we were the owner of the label's favorite band, so he was pretty, uh, you know, open to to our ideas. But we looked at it and we're like, "Geez, we can't afford a lawyer. What do we do?" So we went out and got a six pack of beer, a pack of cigarettes, went back to the guitar player's house, and just 
mowed through this thing until we understood it and wrote down what it all meant and what we didn't like and what we did like and took it to the guy and negotiated it. That anybody can do that. They write contracts to confuse you and use language that looks complicated. But if you just take a breath, read it slowly, you'll start to understand it. And I think that's something everybody who's in publishing or playing in a band or looking for a deal or even signing a show contract, whatever it is, don't just sign it, learn how to read it and understand what it means. And secondly, if you can get something to record yourself at home, next time we're in a pandemic, we'll give you a howl. Uh, <laughs> uh. I would I would say that um, I would add to that, and that's certainly good advice. The other aspect of that is I would say anyone that's writing songs, you should make sure that you have your publishing straight because a lot of musicians I know just don't even understand publishing and how it breaks down and what the difference between ASCAP and BMI is and you know how royalties work and what how you get paid and who you get paid from and the fact that like every time you move and every time you change your phone number you need to update these people because they don't know how to pay you if you disappear <laughs> and so just lots of musicians I know kind of will be like guys with like who've sold records will be like, yeah, I never get anything. I'm like, when was the last time you told your publisher where you live, what you're for? Like, do they even know to send you a check? Well, no, shouldn't they? No, they shouldn't do anything. It's on <laughs> you, man. You want to get paid, <laughs> leave a paper trail, you know? So I always just tell people like get with BMI or ASCAP, learn about what it is you're doing. You know, it doesn't cost a lot of money. Manage that stuff. Register your songs. If you feel like it's warranted, warranted, start your own publishing company. You don't need to do that. But if you feel like you need to do it, do whatever. But it's, it's, it's the only way besides live shows that musicians really make any money. You know, if you license songs and stuff to TV and commercials, you will get paid on that stuff if you have your act together. Um, it's something you can own forever. Yeah, it's literally, it's the, I mean, in my career, I mean, you know, I mean, Bruce and I have played just together, you know, geez, probably upward of a thousand gigs together between various bands. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you make money here and there doing it. And it's nice to walk away with a couple hundred bucks on a good night here in Los Angeles. And that's being very generous uh, in your pocket. But like, you know, if you write a song and it gets in a commercial or let's say it gets in like an episode of a TV show, you'll forever, forever. And then, and then your kids will get paid on that. Might mm -hmm. not be a lot, but it's something. And if, it's, you're, if you're entitled to it, you should be getting paid. And a lot of times what happens is musicians do this, write these songs, record them, and then they do end up sometimes ending up in places where, where there's revenue generated, but they don't even know how to collect it. Or they've been sloppy about it and the money is just sitting there and they're not bothering to collect it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So yeah, yeah. Wow. It's, it's a drag. It happens because all the time. It happens all the time. And like I've talked to, I don't want to name any names, but like major, major artists, like guys who've been on like multiple platinum records, like like guys where you'd be like, what? You're kidding me. And like they're just, they're just kind of oblivious to like the whole publishing side and i'm like dude that's the only way you make money you can't be oblivious to that side right wow well that's great advice thank you guys so much josie i i've already got your advice but if you want to chime in you're <laughs> i want to i want to hear josie's advice yeah oh, me too my, my i can't even remember what i said i i probably changed my mind about it i would say um uh i would say having a really mean lawyer is a really good, <laughs> good rule of thumb. <laughs> Someone that nobody likes, and uh, and uh, I, I think that that was my big mistake. I I, I chose a lawyer I uh, I liked, so that was <laughs> my downfall. <laughs> it's okay if you like them. <laughs> nobody no, else can. Though. That is true, that <laughs> the record company cannot like them. Uh, right. Yeah. I Got was, it. yeah. 